All right, so get this. You're putting together your investment portfolio and you want to know how many stocks should you include. You want those returns up, but got to keep that risk down. Classic balancing act. Exactly. And you'd think keeping it simple would be the best way to go. Hmm. Especially since too many stocks for the data points you have could lead to overfitting. Yeah. But today we're diving into research that completely flips that idea on its head. It's called double descent in portfolio optimization. Dance between theoretical sharp ratio and estimation accuracy. And it's going to make you rethink everything. This research really challenges the conventional wisdom about model complexity and how accurate your predictions can be. So this paper suggests that building a really complex portfolio, one with even more assets than data points, might actually be a good thing. It's a fascinating concept, and it directly challenges that traditional U-shaped relationship we usually see between complexity and performance. Okay, I'm all ears. Walk me through it. So as you add assets to your portfolio, performance initially improves, which makes sense, right? Right. But then you hit that overfitting zone and things start to go downhill. Yeah, that's the classic problem. Exactly. But here's the twist. If you keep pushing beyond that, zone performance can actually rebound. Hold on, really? I thought overfitting was like a point of no return. That's what makes this research so groundbreaking. It's like discovering a hidden path. So is this something unique to investing or has this been seen elsewhere? It's actually been observed in machine learning too, this double descent curve. It suggests that maybe our understanding of model complexity needs a serious update. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. This is already blowing my mind. How does this even work in the world of investments? Well, the researchers found two key mechanisms are at play. The first one is what they call the economic mechanism, which involves something called the clairvoyant sharp ratio. Clairvoyant sharp ratio, that sounds pretty intense. Think of it as like the ultimate performance, the best you could possibly get if you knew absolutely everything about the future of each asset. Oh, so like a perfect scenario. Exactly. Of course, no one can actually predict the future, right. but we can study how this theoretical sharp ratio changes as you add more assets to your portfolio. So does this ratio just keep going up as you add more and more assets? It does initially, but with diminishing returns. Oh, okay. There's yeah. a limit to how much potential return you can get, even in theory. Okay. That's the economic side. What about this statistical mechanism? what's happening on that front. This is where it gets really interesting in high dimensional scenarios where you have more assets than data points, you've got more parameters than data constraints, and that creates a hidden selection process linked to something called inductive bias. Inductive bias, I'm guessing that's a bit technical. It is, but think of it this way. It's like setting preferences for the kind of solution you want. The estimator used in this research has an inductive bias that favors portfolios with small norms. It prefers solutions where the weights assigned to different assets aren't too extreme. So it's like it's trying to find a balance between the assets. Exactly. And here's the kicker. This bias leads to portfolios that resemble the simple equal weighted portfolio. You know, the one where you just put the same amount of money in each asset. Wait, are you telling me that a super complex model might guide us towards something as basic as the equal weighted portfolio? I thought those were considered way too simplistic. It does seem counterintuitive, but that's the fascinating part of this research to suggest that in the realm of high dimensionality, a complex model can actually point us toward a simple yet robust solution. Okay, no, I'm really curious to see how this plays out in the real world. Did they actually test this with actual stock market data? They did. They absolutely did. They dug into U.S. stock market data using monthly returns from January 1967 to June 2019. That's over 50 years of information. Wow, that's a huge data set. And they didn't just use any stocks. They focused on the largest 1,500 each month based on market capitalization. Okay, but why not stick with individual stocks for this? They got a little more creative. They sorted these stocks into the portfolios based on 70 different characteristics. Things like a company's size, value, momentum, you know, all those factors investors use to evaluate stocks. So they created these mini portfolios based on shared traits. Exactly. Like a portfolio of large cap value stock or one with 
small cap, high growth stocks. Yeah, they ended up with 700 different characteristic ranked portfolios to work with. 700. This gave them a wider range of assets to play with for their research. Okay, I'm following so far. So how did they use these 700 portfolios to test their theory? That's where the portfolio optimization comes in. They tested different portfolio sizes, starting with just two of these characteristic ranked portfolios okay. and gradually increasing the number. So some portfolios had just a handful of these mini portfolios, right? while others had hundreds. Precisely, they wanted to see how performance changed as they increased the portfolio complexity. But keeping the amount of training data fixed, this let them clearly measure how the portfolio size affects the performance. And they were using that pseudo-inverse estimator to determine the optimal weights for each portfolio, right? That's right, the one that prefers those balanced portfolios. They wanted to see how that double descent phenomenon we talked about plays out, specifically in the context of this estimator and its inductive bias, Remember, the key is to look at out-of-sample performance. Right, because that's what really matters in the real world. Exactly. How well do these portfolios perform on data they haven't seen before? That's the real test. Of course, past performance doesn't guarantee future returns. Yeah. But did this wild double descent thing actually show up in the stock market data? The results mirrored the theory perfect. There was a sweet spot in the low-dimensional regime where performance peaked, then as they added more portfolios and hit that overfitting zone performance dipped, but then as they kept going, ventured into that high dimensional regime with more portfolios than data points, performance started to climb again. So more really can be better even when it seems counterintuitive. That's the fascinating thing about this research. It challenges our long held beliefs about complexity and overfitting. Hmm. And there's another really intriguing Finding the portfolios in that high dimensional regime achieved sharp A ratios that were significantly higher than those from traditional portfolio optimization techniques. So not only does this approach work, it might actually outperform the tried and true methods. That's what their data suggests, although more research is definitely needed. Right, of course. But it's a really tantalizing possibility. Now remember that clairvoyant sharp ratio we talked about earlier, the theoretical best performance. The one we can't actually achieve because we can't predict the future. Right, well the researchers use their empirical results to actually estimate how this theoretical sharp ratio changes as you add more assets to the portfolio. Wait, so they estimated something that's supposed to be unknowable. How'd they do that? They made some educated assumptions. They assumed the relationship between the clairvoyant sharp ratio and the number of assets followed a specific mathematical form, an equation that captures the idea that the sharp ratio goes up as you add more assets, but eventually plateaus. So they plugged in the results from their stock market experiment and worked backward to figure out the theoretical maximum. That's the gist of it, yeah. And they estimated that for their set of assets, the maximum possible sharp ratio was around 1.44. 1.44, that seems pretty high, doesn't it? It is, it's impressive, especially compared to the market's sharp ratio during that same period, which was only around 0.42. Wow, so this finding has implications for asset pricing models, right? It does those frameworks that try to explain why different assets have different expected returns. Right. So if you assume that all asset pricing factors, like the market factor, have the same sharp ratio, then you can use this maximum possible sharp ratio to estimate how many independent factors are actually needed to explain the returns we see in the market. So it's like you're reverse engineering the market's complexity based on the highest possible performance. Exactly. So how many factors did they estimate were at play? Based on their calculations, they estimated that it would take about 12 independent factors to reach that theoretical sharp ratio limit of 1.44. 12 factors. Wow, that's a lot more than the Fama French five-factor model, which only has five, as the name suggests. Exactly. This research suggests that there might be a lot more nuance and complexity driving market returns than those traditional models capture. Okay, color me intrigued, but how much of this double descent effect is driven by that clairvoyant sharp ratio going up as you add assets and how much is just about reducing estimation error? That's a great question. In the high dimensional regime, the improvement they saw wasn't really due to an increase in the clairvoyant sharp ratio. It was mostly about reducing estimation error. So the benefits of complexity were more statistical than economic. Precisely. This means that even though there's a theoretical limit to diversification based on the underlying economics in practice, you can push those limits further than we thought yeah. thanks to the power of statistics. Fascinating stuff. This is definitely making me rethink my approach to portfolio construction. 
right? Should we all be rushing to stuff our portfolios with as many assets as possible? Not quite. It's important to remember that this research is focused on a very specific type of portfolio, the mean variance efficient portfolio. It's a theoretical construct that aims to maximize returns for a given level of risk. And it's not the only way to approach portfolio construction. So this research is more about understanding the nuances of complexity rather than advocating for blindly building massive portfolios. The biggest takeaway here is that complexity, when handled correctly, can be a really powerful tool. It's not always the enemy, like we often assume. But there are limitations, right? Yeah. It can't be as simple as more is always better. Absolutely. This study uses a specific estimator with a unique inductive bias that favors those balanced portfolios. Right. The choice of estimator and its properties can significantly influence the results. We need more research to explore if this double descent phenomenon holds up with other types of portfolios, different estimators, and under different market conditions. That makes sense. And what about the practical side of things? Managing a portfolio with hundreds of assets sounds incredibly complex and potentially expensive. That's a great point, and one that this research doesn't explicitly address trading costs, liquidity issues, rebalancing complexities. These are all factors that get more complicated and potentially more expensive as the portfolio size and complexity increases. So it's not just about chasing the highest theoretical Sharpe ratio. It's about finding that sweet spot between potential returns and real-world constraints. Exactly. This research opens up a new avenue for exploration and portfolio optimization, uh -huh. but it's definitely not the final word. This makes me wonder about the role of AI. Could AI models with their ability to handle tons of data and identify complex patterns, could they use this double descent phenomenon to their advantage? That's a fascinating question and one that researchers are actively exploring AI, particularly deep learning models, thrives in these high dimensional spaces. Yeah, they love data. Right. These models might be able to leverage double descent to uncover hidden patterns and relationships that traditional methods might miss, leading to entirely new investment strategies. So it's like giving these AI models the freedom to explore a much wider range of possibilities even those that might seem counterintuitive at first. So as we wrap up this deep dive, it seems like the main takeaway is that this research challenges our assumptions about complexity and opens up some exciting new possibilities. It suggests that complexity might not be an enemy, after all, it might actually be an ally, but we need to approach it with careful consideration and a healthy dose of skepticism. I couldn't have said it better myself. The key is to stay curious, keep asking questions, and keep exploring this fascinating world of finance and data. And on that note, we'll conclude our deep dive into double descent in portfolio optimization. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey of discovery. 